Black women's dating experiences are frequently portrayed negatively and by name-calling, often reducing them to shallow material seekers. Usually when referring to black women who express a desire for the finer things in life, terms like blessee and slay queens are employed. Well, this is the theme of Lebo Masango's book called The Soft Life. Lebo is a writer and an award-winning poet who holds a Master of Arts degree in Social Anthropology from the University of Vitz. Well, she joins us now to discuss this further. Lebo, thank you so much for your time and thank you for joining us in our studios. Good morning. Lovely <laughs> to be here. So so talk to us about the inspiration behind writing uh, The Soft Life. So The Soft Life is based on my master's thesis mm -hmm. in social anthropology and I was really interested in romantic experiences, uh, young women's dating lives, but I wanted to connect it to broader concerns around our socio-economic situation in the country, our social political situation in the country because the biggest conversation that we were having about black women's intimate lives was around, as you mentioned, a very reductive kind of t terms like blessee and slay queen. It was always reduced to um, you know something very negative mm. as well and so what I wanted to do was to actually take a look at these young women who would be termed as such what are their motivations what are their experiences why are they choosing to date in particular ways but also to connect that to the fact that any logical person in South Africa is making uh, very rational decisions around you know their, their intimate lives in this manner possibly yeah and, and I suppose I think it's important for the conversation maybe to just talk Talk about what it what the soft life means. Um, I know that you spoke to a number of women um, when you were conducting your research and putting the book together. What are they saying is the soft life? So what I can definitely say is that the soft life differs according to each person. It really is what you make of it. But for the women in the book, because they have different experiences, because they come from different socioeconomic backgrounds, for one of them, you know, the soft life would be um, having a steady supply of electricity so that she can be able to do all of her work, attend to the work that she does, um, while someone else it might be going to the spa midweek and going on shopping trips or going overseas. It differs from person to person, but I think what is common amongst all of them is the fact that our current social political situation the economy as it stands is a very big constraint to people accessing lives of luxury of comfort even basic comfort and so making decisions around how they are dating how they are spending their time um, has been one of the strategies that women have had to employ uh, and so this isn't a matter of transactional sex at all mm -hmm. but it is a matter of pairing with people uh, with whom you can access a better standard of living. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think we forget sometimes that even, you know, things like marriage weren't always, you know, romanticized. And really, mm. it was an economic thing, or at least the reasoning behind it was very much economically based and financially based. You know, the bringing together of two families, the mm. merging of estates, it was very much uh, driven by finances. And so, uh, of course, over the years, marriage and, ro and relationships have been romanticized, you know, with Disney, i.e. finding the one. What's happened today, though, in the culture? What's the shift that's happening right now that's sort of given women, I suppose, the agency to say that this is how I want to construct a romantic relationship or this is what I feel a romantic relationship should look like. And that is such an excellent point that you make about marriage because it's only in the last century or so um, that marriage has been about love, mm. about finding the one, etc. Whereas, whereas it was for very pragmatic and practical means in the past. What the shift has been um, in the past, I suppose, decade is the entry of social media. Social right. media has really empowered Empowered women in really interesting and new ways because for the first time all of us as human beings are accessing people who look like us people who perhaps have similar life experiences but from a different geopolitical context mm. and so our aspirations are definitely um, being changed you know because if women uh, if influencers let's say in the UK and the US can have a particular standard of living through the aesthetic entrepreneurship that they practice as influencers then perhaps you know the women in South Africa are thinking that they can do that too but what social media has also done is that it has made us uh, besides more aspirational more unapologetic because mm. we spend so much time uh, putting our personalities on digital spaces and in digital media uh, it makes us more unapologetic to articulate what it is we want and don't want mm. um, and so 
I think that's really been the shift because now young women are actually able to see the difference in the fact that you know South Africa is what it is in terms of our socioeconomic situation. However, their aspirations are pulling them in um, other directions completely, mm -hmm. and so they are just deciding to just. Uh, be more mindful and be more strategic in how they enter romantic relationships. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned the, 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 the sort of geopolitics uh, referencing the, the sort of lives that we're exposed to, but a, as you know, South Africa has its own very unique social fabric, yeah. uh, its, its own very unique experiences and I wonder with with the women that you had the privilege of speaking to what's the South African experience in attempting to attain the soft life so um, and that really is what is at the heart of the book and I begin the book with COVID-19 mm -hmm. and I feel that it was important to do so because it was a global disaster that all of us um, experienced and all of us can recognize and it was so recent um, especially when we think of March 2020 mm -hmm. that was so recent and those feelings of loss devastation and deprivation are something that we can all relate to mm -hmm. however it is at that same time that I began to notice this phrase the soft life mm -hmm. and it was being deployed more and more on social media and it was incongruent to me that that was happening but you know as a social scientist I went there uh, to begin this book and so we start in a situation where the young women are experiencing a lot of um, uh, financial um, challenges, you know, employment challenges, we don't know what's happening with the development of this disease. Um, and so what the, the experience has been is that um, it, it has imprinted itself on us in very unique ways, right. but through digital media, actually, young women found a way to still access uh, some semblance of a soft life because there's also a, diff a different part of this conversation about masculinity mm -hmm. and how a moneyed masculinity is the most attractive kind of masculinity in a very patriarchal society. Right. And so those pairings are still happening. Um, under very difficult constraints, yes, but I think women are, because they are putting themselves on social media, they are able to find these matches, as opposed to when they are very unapologetic and quiet about it, then, you know, you are shamed into not getting what it is that you aspire yeah. to. Something else that isn't unique to South Africa, but certainly is, is prevalent, is, of course, the issue of gender-based violence, yeah. and when we talk about, uh, you know, the hyper-masculine uh, individual or example, and, and, and you talk about a man who has a lot of money and has a lot of access to means and resources, oftentimes what we've seen in, in, in certain instances is, you know, there's, there's a power dynamic there in which the woman is oftentimes left um, almost beholden uh, to the, the, the male individual, the male representative in this instance. And I wonder if in some of the experiences that were shared by the women, they were able to relate to instances where while they enjoy agency because they're successful, they're intelligent, and they enjoy agency in other areas, they found mm -hmm. that in their romantic context, it suffered a little um, in wanting to achieve and aspire uh, towards the soft life. So that is, is a fantastic question also because, you know, there is a chapter, my fourth chapter is specifically around the issue of violence and risk because you cannot have a conversation around, you know, accessing resources, mm -hmm. um, especially through romantic relationships without being very... Um, yeah, serious about the fact that South Africa has the situation with gender-based violence. And so what we do there um, is each woman speaks about the experience of threats, of violence, of harm. Mm -hmm. But what was very interesting, because I speak to five different women, so what was very interesting is that it was rare that it was actually their partner that they experienced that through, mm -hmm. but it was actually through maybe um, a friend's partner who harmed them, or it was... Um, uh, some, one of them, her, one of her uh, business, someone that she's related to in business actually ended up um, assaulting her in, 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 a, in a particular kind of way. And so what my conclusion then is that the situation is that all women are under threat of harm from all men in public and private spaces. That is why the gender-based violence situation is as it is. And so they 
that does not deter them at all mm -hmm. because they have found strategies to keep themselves safe in different ways. And this is why digital media is another very important component of the work that I'm doing and of the time we're currently living in because what social media gives you and what dating apps sometimes give you uh, is that that distance, that ability to communicate but keep a safe distance until you feel that this is um, a, a and relationship you can enter to, into without harm. Mm -hmm. uh, but they are all very aware of the fact that if at any moment my partner should decide to harm me, I'm powerless against that. However, they do put the necessary um, parameters in place to try to safeguard themselves as much as possible. Yeah. I mean, when I, I mentioned to you off camera that I, I went to your book launch and it was predominantly made up. I would say the makeup was mostly women mm. and the reception was incredible. I am curious about what the male reception has been of your book. Uh, talk to me about whether or not there have been instances of male fragility where men have felt uh, threatened by you know this book that is essentially giving voice or maybe not giving voice but at least to putting up uh, for public consumption a reality that we as women know of and um, you know support e each other in but don't necessarily put out there for fear of you know pushback mm. from you know the other gender that doesn't necessarily understand what's happening yeah so what's been very interesting about male reception to my book is that um, First of all, mm. I don't think South African men read books by women. <laughs> Let's start there. I okay. think they, they read a lot of male-centered self-help business, you know, right. get money kind of books, mm. right? Uh, but for those who have read my book, the, the, the reception has been wonderful because they are those who understand what it is that I'm trying to do. Mm. And so they respect it and also they appreciate it. And then there are those who are trying to understand the women in their lives or the women they aspire to be with. So they just send me messages like, oh, enjoying your book. I'm taking notes. Now I know what to do, you know, in the dating world. Um, I know what is valuable. I've given them tips. <laughs> they, they, know, they know what's valuable. Yeah, maybe the pool will be right. better. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think that's, I think um, I, I'm really enjoying my experience in that because um, let's talk about romance and dating, but let's not leave it at the frivolity. Like, yes. let's talk about the seriousness of it. And at the end of the day, we're all human beings. We all want to access, you know, love and intimacy and that kind of emotional security. Mm -hmm. And so it's important to talk about these things from all angles and not just from, you know, um, funny, um, frivolous angles. Yeah. yeah. All right. I want to bring it home. Uh, level and, and talk about how this book has affected you. I think sometimes as a researcher, I'm not sure, but it, 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 I, I get the sense that you, you can be f removed from the work itself, and that's probably important for the process to sort of let uh, the, the data saturate itself and, and emerge as what it is. But how has the book affected you personally and how you now move in this world of, of dating and, and how are you experiencing romantic relationships with this knowledge that's accumulated over time? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Up close and personal. <laughs> okay, so, um, yeah, so I, I'm very deliberate as a researcher, as a social scientist, as an anthropologist, I'm very deliberate in, um, you know, producing knowledge that mm -hmm. will be very helpful and generative for people who look like me. And so I center my work around black women. So in terms of personally how it's affected me, I mean, it has, I, I really loved writing this book. I really enjoy that it exists. So it's, it's given me community with women, right? Mm. It's given me community with women because I actually speak to so many book clubs and we sit and we talk about the book and it gets women thinking differently and reflecting differently. Um, in terms of my dating life, it's done nothing really. Um, I don't have a dating life because I work so much. Yeah. Um, but I think it's given me like so many interesting conversations with women and just to hear how they're receiving it just to hear that they are thinking differently about the relationships they're in and the marriages that they're in but from a standpoint of wanting those interactions and relationships to be more beneficial for them mm -hmm. and you know how can I access um, you know more comfort uh, in ways that are secure and also beneficial for my partner and I and I think that is fantastic that it gets to mm -hmm. move in the world and do that kind of work yeah. well yeah. the book is out of course it's been out for a while uh, what are your hopes for uh, women, men, um, uh, you know, who, who pick it up and, and, and go through the pages. I mean, what's your hope 
for that experience for them. I'm really hoping for a personal reflection um, and you know when I speak about and when we speak about the fact that black women and dating and romance and love unless you are married um, you are usually the, the the target of so much like derision and so much negativity especially when we think about what makes it into the media but at the same time these conversations that are being had in the media are comprised of individuals right mm -hmm. so I'm hoping that each individual will reflect on how they speak about these situations how they mm -hmm. speak about black women what uh, conversations we allow to reach the public realm mm -hmm. but also to personally reflect on the fact that our our moral panic should not be targeted at black women. Mm -hmm. The truth is that it should be targeted at the governing party because all of the constraints, limitations, challenges, difficulties, obstacles we are experiencing in our intimate dating lives can be directly linked to our current socio-economic political situation. Mm -hmm. Your ability to afford certain things or not is directly linked to what is happening at the top. And so that is where our ire should be pointed at and not necessarily at individual young women or women in general mm -hmm. making the best of the situations and circumstances they find themselves in. Wow. Well, well, this has certainly been insightful and congratulations on the book and thank you so much for joining us in our studios. That was writer and award-winning poet Lebo Masang.